Are you struggling to free up time for client advisory work? Is scope creep hurting your fixed pricing model? Are your quality control processes lacking? Is your staff stuck in a never-ending monthly close process? Ever wish you had a genie that could help you out? Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, SmartBooks Genie, later in the episode. The IRS employees are complaining that the agency isn't providing enough access to hand sanitizer, gloves, and other types of protective equipment, even though many of them are opening mail and handling other people's tax documents. He's heard disconcerting stories about the lack of effort at the IRS to maintain clean workstations, despite recommendations to make this a priority. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by ClockShark. Way back in October of 2013, I became ClockShark's very first Twitter follower. Today, ClockShark has grown into a highly rated and very much loved time tracking app that is now used by over 5,000 small businesses. With features like crew tracking, scheduling, overtime notifications, routes, geofencing, locations, job costing, budgeting, and reporting, the ClockShark team has built a robust mobile time tracking app to handle the unique challenges that face your clients who have mobile workforces. By using ClockShark, you and your clients will be confident that their time tracking data is correct and perfectly synced with their QuickBooks or ADP, allowing payroll to be on time and accurate. While other time tracking apps are charging as much as $8 or more per month per employee, ClockShark offers ClockShark Standard Plan for just $6 a month per employee. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash ClockShark. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-L-O-C-K-S-H-A-R-K. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by OnPay. OnPay is an easy-to-use, full-service payroll that's the right fit for all your clients, whether they have just one or 500 employees. They handle all the complicated stuff like agricultural payrolls, Form 943, multi-state, and H-2A visas. OnPay even makes it easy to switch from other payroll services by doing all the data entry for each client that you set up. Right now, Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners can get three free months of OnPay payroll service. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash OnPay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-N-P-A-Y. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. And I, I'm really sorry to do this, David, because we just recorded an entire episode about coronavirus and COVID-19 last night. And now you know we're doing our regular news episode today, but I, I, there's more news that has broken on coronavirus. So I got to start with that. All right. Before you do that, can we do good news first? Because I promised everybody yesterday we'd try not to talk about coronavirus in today's episode. <laughs> okay. There's good news. Yes, there's please. Absolutely. News. So uh, one, of the, one of the big things is very celebratory. Um, Practice Ignition, they announced their top 50 women in accounting for 2019. And this is like the second year they've done this? Yes. Second year. And if you go through the list, A, you'll recognize listeners that have tweeted or posted on LinkedIn about us or left reviews. You'll recognize guests of the podcast. You'll recognize friends that we've hung around with at conferences and take, taken photos with. So it's it's really cool to see a list like that when there's a bunch of people you know on there. It's It makes you feel good. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's on the practiceignition.com slash blog. Correct. And the link will be in the show notes. And I just want to say right now, congratulations to Liz Mason right there at the top of the list. Uh, under the banner, I'm going to go through this later. I didn't, I didn't see that this was uh, out, so that's great. Uh, I just have a few coronavirus updates relevant to the accounting world. The union that represents IRS employees is ramping up calls for the agency to improve its coronavirus response. This is covered in Bloomberg Tax. The article came out yesterday afternoon, March 12th, around 1 p.m. The union representing the IRS employees is saying that there hasn't been enough done to keep workers safe. Businesses and event organizers across the U.S. have taken precautions to slow the spread of the coronavirus. David, you may have heard that LAUSD uh, just closed all the schools starting Monday, and many, many businesses are working from home, as we talked about on our coronavirus episode. Uh, but apparently the federal government isn't doing uh, very much. The quote from the National Treasury Employees Union President Tony Reard Reardon is the overall government effort to protect employees has fallen far short. The IRS employees are complaining that the agency isn't providing enough access to hand sanitizer, gloves, and other types of protective equipment, even though many of them are opening mail and handling other people's tax documents. He said that he's heard disconcerting stories about the lack of effort at the IRS to maintain clean workstations, despite recommendations to make this a priority. Uh, and this is important 
As mentioned in the article, 45% of the IRS workforce will be eligible to retire within the next two years, meaning that they're probably on the older side. So they're in like the the danger zone for COVID-19. Yeah, because it starts around 50. And then once you hit 60, that's when the chance of hospitalization of death is much, much higher. And the IRS is already short staffed. Wow. Right. So imagine if, you know, this rolls through the IRS during tax season and a bunch of IRS people are out, they're dead, they're, you know, in hospitals for a month. As we talked about on the last episode, the ASCPA has called for tax season to essentially be delayed. October 15th would be the new deadline. And I think that's got, I mean, I I don't see how this happens because it's not like the IRS folks can work from home. The, yeah, they we, can't we, work from home. They they can't just bring in some people from a different agency like, ah, hey, can take some people from this agency over here, stick them in here. Yeah, it's highly uh, specialized work. And, you know, we, we talked about IRS systems like you, you generally don't want people working from home when they're uh, handling, you know, sensitive information uh, like taxpayer returns and whatnot, like at, at the government level. But even if that was a good idea, they, I doubt they have the systems to do that, given that we've talked about on the show how they are just like starting to upgrade their mainframe systems. I guess you'll have to monitor that, right? Is there is there some sort of re- uh, online bulletin board that IRS employees hang out at? It'd be interesting to stay on top of what's happening internally there. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, if, if any of our listeners know what's going on, or maybe we even have a listener who works there, uh, let us know. You can call our listener voicemail number. It's 202-695-1040. That's 202-695-1040. If you have any inside information on this, if you are in a firm that is dealing with coronavirus and you have a story to share, maybe you work at the IRS, we'd love to hear from you and uh, find out you know, what's, what's going on on the front lines. So the IRS has taken some action. They have suspended all non-essential travel for 30 days unless it is, quote, mission critical. You know, we're going to see what's going to happen uh, in the coming days, and I'll keep you posted. Daniel, you were talking about remote work. I have an article that the title has the word coronavirus in it, but it's not actually I, – I feel like it's really what the article is not about. It's a Medium blog post. So it's a little bit of an opinion piece. But Well, it's, um, everyone who likes writing about remote work, this is, the, this is the biggest thing that's happened in remote work since I don't know when. I mean, when have millions of people all of a sudden had to leave the office and go work from home? All at once. It, it's never happened, right? It's, yeah. it, you could argue it's never happened. And this article is titled, Coronavirus is a Preview of Our Self-Isolating Future. So if you kind of skip through the parts where he talks about the virus and kind of get into, you know, some, some of his article, I think, uh, addresses um, good takeaways and ideas. But he also gets into some of the bigger issues concerning working from home on both like an individual and business level, as well as like a gr- global and societal level. Some of the tips, though, I thought he he. he pointed out working at home, you can go out for a jog anytime you want, come home and you could be all sweaty and unkept and you just keep working. I've done that. I've done that myself. <laughs> um, I, and, and, but the bad thing is sometimes that rolls into, you know, I'm taking a shower at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, which is always bad as well. Right. Um, one thing that he said he started to do, which I think is a really cool idea, is he started to have remote coffee with coworkers. They each set a video chat up for like 20 minutes. And at the exact same time, they all go brew their cup of coffee, sit back down and chat with each other. I just got an invite from the team here at Giraffe for our first Zoom video happy hour today at like 4.45. Cheers. So we're going to try that. Yeah, because cool. uh, I, I work remote all the time, but most of the team is in uh, – well, the biggest grouping of the team in the US is in San Francisco, and they're all working from home, of course, because it's San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. And, so we're going to yeah. try that. And you also talked about this impact on like business in general. Like yeah. As more people – do this work remotely and companies figure it out, they're going to need less and less office space. And then at what point does having an office become a luxury, a nice to have, yep. and and companies just cut it off the balance sheet? And, and an indication of this, I don't know if you saw, there's a quick headline that went through um, Carl Icahn. Is it Icahn or Icahn? Uh, <laughs> we have, we, I think it's uh, Icahn. We need or like a third executive producer that does nothing but correct our pronunciations on names. Well, you know, uh. like NPR has fact checkers, and I think that's one of the things that they do. And so maybe someday we can afford a fact checker. Fact checker. Okay. But he, he's the legendary short seller. Like he went after Herbalife and all – like historically yeah. all these companies, he's, he's been – now his current target is commercial office space. So he's shorting commercial office space companies thinking that 
once this all ends, people are not going to go back to the office, or at least a, a good chunk aren't. Probably is a smart bet. I mean, because I think we've talked about in previous episodes where in the whole entire market, it's still like 1% or 2% of workers work from home. Like it's almost nobody right now. 3% of the American workforce works from home full time. But a big, big chunk of the knowledge economy, 50% work remotely at least part of the time. So the capability for a lot of white collar workers, a lot of knowledge workers, people who work behind computers to go work remotely full time, it's there. It's just a cultural resistance uh, or management resistance to that happening. So maybe this pushes that forward. I mean, even if this just moves from 3% to 10% oh, when, it, when it's done, it's it's a yeah. monstrous move and it's going to affect office space So in, in that type of stuff. Yeah. The other thing well, on the bigger society – oh, good. Sorry. He, well, and here's a further stat to that that I spotted. Uh, this was in The Atlantic. Uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, only 29% of Americans can work from home, like could do it because of the nature of their job. That's actually a pretty big amount, but only one in 20 service workers can do it. Half of information workers have the capability to work from home. And that's where this starts to get into societal issues, right? Where if all the white collar workers are just you know, working from home, they're not commuting, they're not taking subway, they're not taking trains, A, they're not rubbing elbows, right? And getting to be exposed to people of different backgrounds. And then not only that, it's going to impact like lunch spots downtown, things, you know, at, mm -hmm. at that level. But then it goes on deeper levels. Like if you never have to commute as a voter, you're probably not going to vote on transportation issues. Uh, that's true. Or yeah. you're going to you're, you're going to change your opinions on on the societal needs. So mm -hmm. it's just a really good article. If it, uh, it, It'll spur some thinking, especially right now when all of you are working home, working at home. Just to think about, is there a big, huge impact of working at home beyond coronavirus? When it could. Yeah. Actually, I, th I think you're right. It could really have some deep impacts on our society. But, you know, this was happening already. Uh, this is just accelerating a trend, right? We were, I, I've been complaining about housing costs here in California. <laughs> every episode or every few episodes, I talk about how that's pushing people out of California to places like Nevada, Arizona, and they are working remotely with their team that they used to work with in California. Maybe they're at an office, but the two offices are basically remote centers, right? They, it's a complex thing because it, it's working remotely doesn't mean necessarily working at your apartment or your house. You could be working in an office with other people in offices all over the country. That is happening more and more and more. And, and as you said it in the past, maybe you work in such a big campus that you end up working remotely with most people anyway. You're on a Zoom call or a Skype call with people in another building because it doesn't make sense to walk. You see this all the time. People yeah. are two cubes away from each other and they spend the whole day chatting with each other through you know, Slack or some, some product like that. Yeah, totally. So I have some uh, practical advice for folks okay. who are making the jump to working remotely. And I know there's probably a lot of firms right now that are struggling because there's a small group of firms that have fully embraced remote and cloud. And then there's a much bigger group that haven't. And so if you are looking for some recommendations for apps that you could use uh, for your specific needs now that you are not in the office, Sandy Leva wrote a great article on CPA Trendlines called Tech Tools for Working Through the Coronavirus. And she lists 11 solutions for 11 uh, needs or 11 categories. Should I go through them? Yeah, why not? Rattle them off. Okay. So for appointment settings, she recommends schedule once. Which I actually have used, not for a long time. I use Calendly now, but um, Schedule Once is very powerful. For conferencing, it's either GoToMeeting or Zoom or both, depending on your needs. Data collection, they use Google Forms, ShareFile, and eFile Cabinet. Their client portal is built using WordPress. I thought that was interesting. They built a client portal integrated into their website because WordPress is a web hosting th platform. They have a shopping cart on their website through Infusionsoft, which is, allows people to pay for their services directly on their website with a credit card. Uh, they do client emails with Aweber and Infusionsoft. Customer support through their website, Vimeo, which is a video hosting platform, and GoToWebinar. I imagine what they're doing with Vimeo is recording screencasts of how to do things or how to help customers with particular applications and then putting those on Vimeo uh, and sending those links out to people when they have questions. For task management, Sandy is using Flow, getflow.com, which I've never heard of. Are you familiar with them at all? 
might be one worth might be one I, worth checking out. Checking out, yeah. So it's one of those like beautiful, simple task management tools. So I'm going to go take a look at that. They're using Slack for messaging, phone calls. They're using Slack and Zoom, and then cloud storage. They're using Amazon S3 and InMotion hosting servers for their hosting of desktop apps. So she wrote this, and it's in. Did you say uh, accounting web? Uh, CPA trend lens. CPA trend lens. This could be something that everybody should do with their own firm on their own blog. People are always worried about what blog content should I have? Like, go blog what your tech stack your that your tech stack is, right? So that way, people, if you, especially if you ha- if you're set up to work in the cloud and take on clients remotely, I think that's a, a, a good brag to have right now. Yeah. Right. So so if you so you do have a tech stack, put it out there, put it in your blog, let other people see it. Yeah, and prospects and clients might really appreciate that because they want to know that they can work with you remotely now because they're probably going to be isolating themselves if they are 60 or older and they're paying attention. They're not going to want to come to your office. So how can you work with them, make them comfortable with that when they've never done it before? I want to add one thing that's very important with the hosting. Sandy says they rent dedicated servers from InMotion Hosting. Dedicated servers, as we have discussed in the past, are critical to security because shared servers are the ones that are more easily hacked by ransomware. So if you're going to go with server hosting, which pretty much everyone has to because there's always one or two apps, especially tax software that you just can't get in the cloud, go with a dedicated server, even though it's more expensive. you have anything else on remote work? Um, That's kind of it. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens during this tax season with the firms that are remote and have already gone cloud, are they going to see a huge return on their investment and be able to grow? Because really nothing's changing for them. I mean, I could be working in a remote firm right now and my life has not changed other than my son actually, who's going to be home now next week, all week. That's that, that that's the, that's the one impact on remote work. I see people are going to try to work from home uh, for because th- some of these schools like are, are closing some some states are closing schools for three weeks. So you're probably working from right. home for three weeks, and your kids are there for three weeks. Like maybe this will completely swing the pendulum the other way. Like nobody will ever want to work at home again. <laughs> yeah, well, but everybody's in the same bucket here, right? Because yeah, so we have to figure this out together. Yeah, I guess unless you're lucky enough to work at home, and then you also have a partner who can watch your child full time. Then it would be more distracting because your kids at home. But yeah, I. I I have an oh. idea. If, you're, that? if you could threaten your kids, if they act up, you're going to make them listen to the cloud accounting podcast. Like you'll <laughs> put it on their phone and force them, to, almost like an opposite of a grounding kind of. Maybe that could be a. So my wife and I are trying to figure out how we're going to educate our child while he's you know be, homeschool him essentially while he's uh, off from school for the next at least two weeks, could be a month or more. And apparently, Khan Academy has classes. Or courses for children. I didn't realize this. I thought it was just adults. Oh, my daughter's done some of those. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really, really good. And I guess they go as young as five or four or five. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to picture my kid doing an online course and sticking with it. But, uh, you know, we'll see. I guess maybe I can set him up at a little desk next to me. He could do that. He could do code.org. <laughs> um, learn how to code that you could have your uh. kids do that the other one it was somebody tweeted uh bookkeeping side hustle who i, I think uh is in the want ads they tweeted about what to do with your kids and, and you can have them learn bookkeeping like put them to work yeah um and that's like maybe that. the best choice right make your kids do the work when you're quote unquote working from home <laughs> <laughs> that might be the best the best the best choice on this is, is actually uh. just have your kids do your work and then you you, you kick back and play Fortnite. uh so should we move on to other bigger and better things? Or not better, but um, there's some fraud scam stuff that's been in the news this week. Yeah, let's talk about uh, – let's talk about – is it more ransomware? This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by SmartBooks Genie. SmartBooks Genie was born out of the struggles experienced by Calvin Wilder as he grew his firm SmartBooks from zero to 40 people in eight years. Calvin has been using Genie to run SmartBooks for the last 18 months, and now he's making Genie available to all accounting and bookkeeping firms to power their client accounting services. SmartBooks Genie layers on top of QuickBooks Online to allow you to centralize your firm's workflows, manage the monthly close, automatically prepare client reports, and complete time-consuming manual processes that you're currently doing in spreadsheets or other isolated systems. By centralizing client management to get core work done accurately and on time, SmartBooks Genie will stay on top of the deadlines and scope of service that you are delivering to clients so you keep your client engagements profitable. 
To learn more about SmartBooks Genie and take advantage of its early adopter program offering 50% off monthly subscription fees, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash genie. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash G-E-N-I-E. SmartBooks Genie grants your wish for a streamlined practice. Yes, yeah, so TurboTax, there's a phishing scam currently going around for TurboTax. And it has an Excel attachment. And so you get an email that says your TurboTax case is open. And the body of the message looks like it's a, uh, you know, a very official email. It says your tax return is about to be rejected and you need to take this action. And the attachment's an Excel file. And when you open the, the, the Excel file, it um, gives you a security warning that encourages you to type in um, how to enable macros in your brow- in your Excel sheet, and then it, then it executes these malicious macros, right? And goes from there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was reported in accounting today, but they link to um, something called trustwave.com. And this is a more of a security website. And they have an article called the monster lurking in hidden Excel worksheet. And you would love this site. Like it, it's all the down and dirty. And actually anybody who loves Excel might love this. It's all the down and dirty stuff you can, or how to build one of these and, and what they did to build this, uh, malicious script inside oh, Excel. To put a virus in Excel. Yes, essentially. Yeah. So it's uh if, if you really want to if you know you're working from home, you have some extra time and you want to do something super nerdy with Excel, you know, that that's an article worth checking out. <laughs> Learn how to build a virus in yes. Excel. Oh boy. Uh, and then there's a super long article from Microsoft um, about human human operated ransomware attacks. What do you mean by human operated? So a lot of ransomware attacks are just a payload that just gets clicked on and gets executed right? by you, the the end user, right? You get right. fished, et cetera. What these are doing is they're using like the uh, remote desktop protocols that are public. They're manually finding a computer, getting into the computer. Then when they're in, in the computer, they'll manually upload some software they need to um, – to poke holes and other computers on the network. And they're just, they're manually doing everything and watching and stealing credentials and working their way up to a deeper computer on the system. And then manually deploying some sort of ransomware attack once they get super, super deep in. Gotcha. Um, and then they kind of call them uh, hands-on keyboard attacks. Interesting. So they start it with the remote desktop protocol. Then they start testing Passwords and usernames like admin, administrator, guest, test, right? Once they gain access and then it starts to to roll up there. And I can see this growing because a lot of firms are going to set up remote desktop on their, on their computers at work so that their employees can remote in. And maybe they've never used it before and they don't configure it in a secure way. And, and Splashtop, who is our – I think they sponsored us, what, last week or the week before? Mm-hmm. That's our remote access to your computer. So there's software that's available. Is it, For anybody that's working for home, it's like, how do I you know, access my computer that's the off, at the office? I mean, these things do exist, but you have to be very, very careful and make sure everything's locked down. Yeah, so maybe don't use the built-in remote desktop in Windows and use something that's more secure. And, and I think for our users, this article is like – way super in depth, but there's a nice chart in there and it just talks about, you know, the common attack techniques and then your possible defenses. So just maybe you print out that chart and then you go down the defenses stuff with your IT department. Gotcha. Did you have any uh, security stuff? I have one more, but I don't know if you had anything. No, go ahead. Oh, so um, there's an article on Business Insider about how there's no such thing as an unhackable phone. Uh, Not even my iPhone? (laughs) No. Um, so you think about uh, Corcoran from last week who uh, had the phishing scam. Yeah. He, uh, we talked about Bezos, right? And he was hacked. So he was hacked through uh, WhatsApp on his iPhone, right? right. He clicked a bad link. And uh, her fraud basically was started with an email. The so super rich and their phones are just as vulnerable as any of us. There's no such thing, right? As, as a device that can't be hacked. And, you know, it, it's some level, it's a game of risk management. And the majority of it's still human error, right? You could build the most secure phone in the world. And if it allows you to download things or talk to people outside of the world, you're at a risk of getting infected mm-hmm. and your data getting stolen. You know, it's just proof like even the the elites of the world don't have any more security than we do when it comes to these devices. So, so the lesson here is uh, I should stop taking all the nude photos on my iPhone. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Because that's, that's what happened with Bezos. Yeah, right. Uh, well, no. Be- was that? Oh, yeah, it was Bezos. It was Bezos. 
and uh. and the the weird thing about that and and th- that's a whole another story and there's lots of articles on it but is he you know it was uh, somebody in like the Saudi royal family who he was talking to on WhatsApp like they met yeah, like, wasn't it the crown WhatsApp prince and, yeah I think so and then they, they sent him a link and then once he uh, opened it yeah it slowly it, it immediately they they're showing like data it just started taking gigabytes of data off his phone. So the lesson mm-hmm. here, again, as with emails, don't click on something unless you're absolutely sure it's safe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It goes on and on and on for that. So I think that's wow. it for security type stuff. Well, I have a couple of ways we could go. I've got follow up on Wells Fargo. I'll let you choose which way we go. So follow up on Wells Fargo or Big Four News. Choose your own adventure, David. Uh, let's go Big Four News first. All right. So KPMG has had some issues with GE, or actually it's really vice versa. GE over the past few years has had some major issues with its auditor, KPMG. KPMG, which has audited GE since 1909, failed to catch a series of accounting problems in recent years, which resulted in 35% of GE shareholders voting last April against KPMG continuing as GE's auditor. And the company said after that it would explore other options. Well, they are now announcing that they will begin their search for a new auditor after the 2019 audit, which they're going to let KPMG finish out. And this is a big deal because the value of their audit business was $133.3 million in 2018. That's according to Audit Analytics. And in the past decade, GE has paid KPMG almost $1.1 billion. So this is a, a, you know, a lot of business. Could be a really big win for another firm. But here's the problem. As detailed in the Wall Street Journal, GE only has three other choices in the big four, PwC, Ernst & Young, and Deloitte. And GE has relationships with all those firms that cause conflicts of interest where those firms can't do the audit unless they clear up those conflicts of interest. So PwC, for example, does GE's tax work and GE outsourced 600 of their employees to PwC. So those people now work at an office for PwC working on GE stuff. They essentially outsource that department and GE couldn't function without it. So that's a problem. Ernst & Young is one of GE's big lobbyists in Washington. They paid Ernst & Young more than any other lobbyist to lobby on their behalf. I didn't even know that EY did lobbying. I I had no idea that the Big Four was doing lobbying for other companies. They do everything. Not just themselves. Wow. Uh, And Deloitte has unspecified business ties to GE, some sort of like business unit that Deloitte is tied up with that would provide, would bar them from being the auditor under the SEC rules. So, you know, KPMG has royally screwed up on the GE audits. And yet, because we only have four big accounting firms capable of auditing a giant multinational company like General Electric, there's there's no market for this. There's nowhere else for them to go. And they're going to have to convince then one of these other firms to give up that business, which is Generally, the consulting business is much more lucrative than the audit business, so they don't want to give it up. So we have a really messed up, not free market situation here with GE. And this is probably a good example of why in the US, we might want to consider doing what it looks like could happen in the UK, which is the the big regulator there, the Financial Reporting Council, has sent a letter to all the big four in the UK telling them that they need to separate their audit and consulting operations in Britain. This was after a string of high profile audit failures. There was the collapse of BHS, Carillion, and Thomas Cook. And the big four firms there audit almost all of the UK's 350 largest listed companies. And after that, the public, the regulator are very, very seriously saying, break up these firms and separate out the audit from everything else. And I personally think that would be a great idea. I'm surprised there's not like a bigger wave of startups and startup money from VCs going into disrupting the big four at this level, at the audit level. Because one contract alone with GE is worth $1.1 billion. Like they're not, like they're not 
the audit isn't being attacked in the same way everything else is being attacked. Everybody's well, here's building the problem with that. Small businesses. Everybody's yeah. building the cloud accounting app. Well, he- here's the huge problem to challenging the big four is they are so large that even the the next I don't even know what the size difference is, but if you look at like a chart of like number of employees and revenue, like you go down after four and down to five, six, seven, eight, like they they are not they they're not even close to being the same size and being all around the world the way the big four are. So if you're a big you know, Fortune 500 company with operations all over the place, you need an auditor that's big enough to be able to handle it. So it's probably similar to or similar to Amheiser Bush, right? In the in the beer industry, right? Like uh, um, Samuel Adams, which arguably is a gigantic beer brand. Everybody's familiar with it. It's everywhere you go. It's all around the world, right? I guess if you take Sam Adams, you add up every other microbrew that's in North America. It's still like only one percent of the entire beer industry. And if I you mean, include Sam Adams with the other ninety nine. Percent of the I, I don't know what crazy. it is, but uh, the, the, yeah, it's, you just can't so get these it are in touch. these firms are so big in terms of people and their ability to do this thing. They're the only ones who can, and to try and challenge them is impossible. So it's a it's like a too big to fail kind of situation, right? They're entrenched, they have huge lobbying power, and they can basically set up the system so that it works really great for them. And only when they have like a bunch of audit failures, like in in Britain, which were way worse even than here, you know, the public turns against you and the politicians turn against you. You know, we'll we'll see what happens in the UK. That's really going to be interesting. Like if if the uh, firms actually voluntarily implement the regulators' proposals, because if they don't, then legislation could happen. But the regulator is going first with uh, you know a voluntary approach, saying do this or <laughs> or else, essentially. Um, so that's the big four news. Want to stick with the profession in general? Yeah, sure. So I know we've talked about you, – this has been kind of your beat. Uh, people are graduating with accounting degrees and they don't have the skills they need. Really? That doesn't surprise me. So there's an article, um, Amid Shifting Industry, College Accounting Programs Add Technology and Data Analytics Courses. So Where was uh, this? This article was in the HartfordBusiness.com. So both UConn and Sacred Heart University have begun to offer graduate certificate programs in accounting analytics or data analytics and their masters of accounting programs. Mm-hmm. And, they're in, and they're encouraging all accounting majors to minor in either business analytics or data sciences. 100%. That is totally on the right track. Well, that's cool. At least somebody's doing this. There, there, there's hope and upside. <laughs> well, I've got a little bit of profession news too. Value of the CPA license. We've talked about that in the past. Yes. A lot of the value for CPAs is how much you can make as a CPA. And it's always fun to revisit these numbers and see how you stack up. Uh, So Divi over at getdivi.com on their blog, they've been doing a series of how much does a blank make? How much does a finance manager make? How much does a CFO make? How much does a controller make? So they finally got to how much does a CPA make? So overall, CPAs make between $65,000 and $150,000 per year. CPAs make 15% more than accountants without certification. So that's a pretty substantial amount, right? Adds up over time. This is national, so it's going to be very, very different depending on where you are in the country. Uh, but going down the list of titles, entry-level accountants are making forty to fifty k. Entry-level CPAs are making about sixty five. dollars CPA credit analysts make about seventy five. dollars Big four firm CPAs make on average 90K. The average CPA salary all around the country, 119K. And then a senior CPA salary averages 152,000. Half of CPAs get annual bonuses, which can be up to 10% of their salary. And salary increases average 4 to 5% annually, which is higher than in many professions. And did this get into any. Um... Like uh, male versus female CPAs? No, they didn't break it down that way. So I have, but that uh, would have been good for them to do during um, International Women's Month. The reason I asked that is the AICPA had a blog post out about three common challenges and three solutions for women in the profession. Well, and this is a great follow-up to the discussion we had uh, last week on our regular news episode about challenges that women face in the profession with inflexible work cultures, that sort of thing. Yeah. And sexual harassment too. So so one is to find a sponsor, right? A sponsor, a mentor, like somebody that can really help you with your career. Mm-hmm. There's different mentorship programs you can do to help with that. And then a lot of them now, companies are focused on diversity. So these these mentorship programs are really 
going for minorities and females first, and you can take advantage of that. Uh, balance your work life. So seek flexible work arrangements. Talk to your employer about uh, work from home programs, work life synergy, use technology, that type of stuff. Yeah, of course. What if your employer doesn't want to offer that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah that, that's what some of the articles we talked about last week. Um, identify role models. Identify females that have done this well, they've moved up, they're managing their careers well. And then the solution for that is, this is a little bit of a plug for them, but it's to attend the AICPA and CMA Global Women's Summit. So, so there's a link to the uh, conference that they're going to do, but that's just um, you know, their third solution. But I think it's very timely in the discussions that, after last week's episode. So let's see when that is. We'll see if it happens this year because it is – oh, it's November 10th through November 12th, 2020 – in Miami. And how'd you find so, out? How'd you, how'd you locate that date so quickly? Well, I went to accountingconferences.com where you can find all of the conferences, like a hundred conferences for accounting and finance folks and see if they're still going when they are. All sorts of other data, right? David, you've got like ways to segment and filter. Yeah. So you could see all the conferences by every month and um, we're staying on top of them. And I know even yesterday we talked about how there was a conference in Australia that hasn't been canceled yet. And within an hour of us getting off the recording yesterday, they did cancel it. So that's uh, up to date and that's up to date on that site. So that was the accounting business expo in Sydney. That's correct. They just postponed that event now. So if you go to accountingconferences.com, if you're wondering what's the status of my accounting conference, that you've attended or paid for. They're all there. And then any of them that are getting um, postponed, we're updating the dates. So you know when it's been postponed to as well. So the last thing I've got this week is the Wells Fargo follow-up. I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> Almost like just unbelievable uh, lack of oversight at Wells Fargo by the board and by management and just resistance to actually implementing any of the changes. They got fined $10 billion over the last few years for this. So this week... The chairman of Wells Fargo, Elizabeth Duke, resigned before she was supposed to testify. Congress had her come and testify anyway. I'm wondering if maybe the resignation was like a way to get out of it, perhaps. But uh, Congress didn't wasn't having any of it. She uh, resigned. That resignation is outlined in a Wall Street Journal article. Link in the show notes. A little bit about her background. Elizabeth Duke joined the Wells Fargo board in 2015. And she became the vice chair in October of 2016, shortly after the bank disclosed that the branch employees had opened perhaps millions of fake accounts without customer consent. She's a former Federal Reserve governor who worked that job during the financial crisis. And she's also been an executive or a CEO at a number of community banks in Virginia. So I feel a little bit bad in that you know she wasn't on the board when this whole scandal or when this whole problem was developing. But um, she was definitely in charge when they were responding to it. The other board director who re resigned was James Quigley. And uh, Mr. Quigley is actually the retired CEO of Deloitte. And he joined the Wells Fargo board in 2013. So they uh, came to the Hill and they testified. And of course, all of that, as we predicted, was overshadowed by coronavirus. So basically, the summary of the of the session, as far as I can tell, is that Representatives in Congress hammered Duke and Quigley, who basically defended themselves. They didn't accept responsibility for it. Uh, they said that they did what they felt was right. I'll go ahead and read this uh, section from the uh, from the article. Duke, a former Fed board, go board governor, and Quigley defended their oversight of Wells Fargo, saying that while they resigned to avoid, avoid further distraction, they did everything they could to drive progress at the bank without overstepping their roles. Here's a quote from Duke. I believe wholeheartedly that we both spent the time, used our judgment, did the inquiries, and did our jobs as thoroughly and completely as we possibly could. And then she added that the plans ordered by fe federal regulators are the responsibility of management. So basically blaming management for this and saying that it wasn't her job or the board's job uh, to implement those plans ordered by the federal regulators. And then uh, Quigley said, effective governance requires clear separation between management and the board. And anytime those lines get blurred, I believe the enterprise becomes less safe and less sound. I know what I've done as a board member of Wells Fargo, and I am comfortable with that work and the way I perform that role. And yet you resign. So why resign if you didn't do anything wrong, right? Yeah. And they're probably, this is going to get so low, lower priority, right? Yeah. 
in light of everything else happening in the world right now, yep. if they can just go away quietly and you know, probably get a nice severance and that's kind of, yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure they'll be fine. You want to talk about cashless stores? Let's, yeah, let's finish up with that. So Amazon is finally opening it, opening its first full-size cashier list store. So there's no cashiers. You just walk in, get you what you need, and you leave. This is like in my neighborhood, right? You're talking about the one in Woodland Hills? Well, but this is a real grocery store. So 5,000 yeah. square feet. Yeah. So we have two actually now. I'm sorry, 10,000 square feet, um, 5,000 items. So it's not an Amazon Go store. It's it's a full-size grocery, Go grocery store. But they're calling it Amazon Go still, right? Oh, Amazon Amazon Go Grocery. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. So they, they're opening that in Woodland Hills, which is, you know, 15 minutes from where I live. So that's what they're going to, because you said, I think you mentioned before, they closed some grocery store. Yeah. So it's not the one right across the street from me, uh, it turns out, but it is within uh very, it's a very short driving distance. So I'm going to go there and check it out as soon as I can, as soon as it opens. And it's interesting. So Amazon, obviously, regardless of how much people are buying online, grocery sales are still not happening online. Right, people still go to grocery stores. You know, you want to look at the fruit. <laughs> people want to touch. Yeah, you want to pick out your stuff. You want to touch it, yeah. and smell it before you buy it, right? And ultimately, grocery stores in general have horrible margins. But Amazon's taking a super long game. I mean, nobody else would spend five years building one store and then just keep going at it, even though it may not be successful. But Amazon doesn't care because, like, their primary mission is to get you get somebody to say Amazon. Well, right? and, and you, you predicted time. this. You predicted this because I've seen stories that um, Amazon's really not interested in building out their own grocery stores. They want to sell the technology to other yes. retailers. I have another article exactly that. Yep. Yeah. You called this. You said they were going to do this the same way that they opened up the Amazon site to the marketplace. And now most of their sales aren't actually from Amazon itself. They're from other sellers who are using Amazon's logistics and warehousing. Well, yeah. So first they figured out how to run software and websites really good. And that became Amazon AWS. and Zero runs on AWS. QuickBooks runs on AWS. The vast majority of apps all of you are working from home using are using right now today are probably running on Amazon's web services. Then all the stuff they figured out about logistics, how to do warehousing, shipping of products, right? Delivery of goods. I mean, they are now doing that for other companies. Like so, and I, I don't know who they're doing it for, but essentially, let's say you're a target and you want to have a big warehouse and start shipping your goods all over, you would just basically drop in Amazon system and use their skills to do that. Mm -hmm. And now the third thing is they've announced, they've they've strung up a couple of deals with uh, retailers that want to go cashierless. So you're going to go into some other store, there won't be cashiers there, and you're going to be able to buy things, walk in, grab your stuff and walk out. And it's all going to be built on Amazon's technology. Yep. You scan the QR code in your Amazon app and all the payment is already taken care of. You just Everything's tracked. You just grab the stuff, walk out. And, and I, it's funny that you say everything's tracked because that's the thing. Um, that's what's going to be the problem that arises on this was because they do these deals with the re, re, uh, retail locations. It's like who owns that shopper data? Is it oh, Amazon's Am Amazon, data? Well, yeah. I or, mean, that's why Amazon's going to give away this technology for a really low price because yeah. of the data. They can then sell more stuff to me. Like I go to all these retailers. I buy stuff using my Amazon app. Then Amazon has that data. They can market more stuff to me that I buy online. Yep, and so so they so they've really started to stack that up. Um, in the meantime, uh, Delaware, they are eyeing a ban on cashless stores, making a law that you have to accept cash. And they they're joining um, what is it uh, like New York City, San Francisco, a number of other cities that have. So this is a whole state that is yeah. going to ban it. Which is interesting because I feel like a lot of some tips I've been seeing, they're telling people not to pay with cash right now. Because of COVID nineteen, so like full circle, like the the government agencies are telling people to they're, they're going to make laws that you have to pay with cash, you have to accept cash, but they're recommending people don't use cash, and they're going to have a ten thousand dollar fine per violation. Oh, great, yeah. Because so, so think about cash, that. It's, it's money is so dirty. You know, we are. <laughs> it's, it's been through all these people's hands. It carries viruses. Yeah. So oh, gross. That that that's kind of a full circle. You know, we're we're you know for all the remote work and cloud and cashierless stores. And we're right back to government intervention as far as like, you must accept cash and count cash and account for cash. And, you know, which is really hassle for small businesses. We've talked about that in previous yeah. episodes. So. It, it costs more to manage and account for the cash than it's worth in a lot of cases for small businesses. Yeah. All right. And that's all the news I have this week. It was nice to, uh, to, to do a pretty much a Corona free virus free yeah. episode. 
We, we try. You know, I mean, we will, I'll have to figure out the percentage of Corona infection in this episode. And I'll let you know, David. <laughs> Hopefully we get through that. Yep. Until next week, stay healthy. Yeah. And then if people want to, you know, whether they're working at home and they want to get in touch with you, Blake, what's the best way? The best way, honestly, is for them to call the listener voicemail number. Call the Cloud Accounting Podcast, 202-695-1040. Let us know what you think about any of the stories we've talked about. Let us know what you're going through this tax coronavirus season. Just say hi. You could even uh, leave us a review. Although we actually prefer if you leave the reviews on Apple Podcasts or on Podchaser because then other folks, uh, when they're looking for podcasts, will see your review and might be more inclined to subscribe. Uh, you are also welcome to contact me on Twitter. I am at Blake T. Oliver. And uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just make sure when you connect, let me know that you're a listener so I know who you are. How about you, David? I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn, both at David Leary. And invitation's still open. If you want to travel to Tucson and you want to go get dinner. No, no, David, yeah, social isolation. <laughs> social, pro uh, what oh, is it? Okay. Uh, In 21 days, I think, if you want to come to Tucson and have dinner, we're allowed to do this. Don't get on a plane it's if you don't have to. Non-essential travel should stop. And go to accountingconferences.com to see all the conferences, what has been canceled, what's still going on. And maybe look for a new conference if the one that you signed up for doesn't work for you anymore. I think there's a hundred to choose from. So wow. All right. Talk to you next week, David. All right. Bye everybody. Time for the classifieds. High Rock Accounting is searching for rock stars. We are a growing accounting firm looking to increase our team. Our ideal candidate will be self-motivated, eager to learn, and grow with the firm. We help businesses succeed by utilizing cutting-edge technology to provide accounting solutions that increase business efficiency and competitiveness. Our goal is simple, enhance accounting operations, improve accuracy, and reduce costs. As a High Rock star, you'll be responsible for full-cycle accounting in a cloud environment. Email careers at highrock.co. That's careers at highrock.co. Accountants and bookkeepers, are you itching to make a career pivot and escape the 9 to 5 grind in the busy season stress and start to build your own career path where you work virtually on your own terms? Then you need to get your copy of the newly released Bookkeeping Side Hustle Guidebook and learn actionable steps to become a virtual bookkeeper without the overwhelm. Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners can get the ebook for 30% off with the code CAP30OFF. Get your copy at bookkeepingsidehustle.com forward slash bookkeeping dash guidebook. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.